What started the Syrian civil war? Were the rebels devout patriots at home or extremist killers from abroad? How did the U.S. mobilize serious support for the opposition of Al Qaeda offshoots? Who were the white helmets, and how were they key to the success of anti-Assad propaganda? What is the fate of the state of Syria after ten years of war? This week on the Global Research News Hour, we feature a special documentary retrospective on the Syrian civil war, which was in fact a foreign-fueled insurgency outlining the state of the players on the opposition side, including the U.S., and a review of the many facets that distinguishes this U.S. war from previous military incursions. The voices include Syrian journalist and commentator Stephen Swahuni, independent journalist and historian Kareth Porter, and Syrian-based Western journalist Vanessa Beely. On this week's program, the Ides of March, 10 years of bloodshed in Syria. Bringing you the analysis beyond the media headlines, the Global Research News Hour is on the air. Welcome to the Global Research News Hour for the week of March 12, 2021. The program is funded by the Center for Research on Globalization and produced in collaboration with campus community radio station CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg, unoccupied Anishinaabe Gaki, the homeland of the Métis and the historical territory of the Nahiawak and the Nakota. I'm your host, Michael Welch. The show seeks to provide listeners with access to analysis of some of the major issues shaping our world today, from thinkers, researchers, and unique political personalities rarely addressed by major media. Our shows are features on partner radio stations across Canada and the United States, and available for streaming or download at the site globalresearch.ca. We'll begin our show with News Notes, a sampling of articles from the Global Research News site. As physicians and scientists, we are supportive, in principle, of the use of new medical interventions which are appropriately developed and deployed, having obtained informed consent from the patient. This stance encompasses vaccines in the same way as therapeutics. We note that a wide range of side effects is being reported following vaccination of previously healthy younger individuals with the gene-based COVID-19 vaccines. Moreover, there have been numerous media reports from around the world of care homes being struck by COVID-19 within days of vaccination of residents. While we recognize that these occurrences might, every one of them, have been unfortunate coincidences, we are concerned that there has been, and there continues to be, inadequate scrutiny of the possible causes of illness or death under these circumstances, and especially so in the absence of post-mortems examinations. That comes from the article, Urgent Open Letter from Doctors and Scientists to the European Medicines Agency Regarding COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Concerns by Doctors for COVID Ethics, posted March 11th. France 24 reports Wednesday that Countries increasingly see these vaccine passports as the best chance to bolster hard-hit tourism industries in places like Spain and Greece. However, since vaccines are still relatively hard to come by in Europe, supplies in the developing world are also scarce, there are concerns that vaccine passports won't work, while also raising thorny privacy issues. Most programs under development are geared towards facilitating travel, and come in the form of smartphone apps with varying criteria for a clean bill of health. Vaccine passports, for example, are a popular way to approach proof of immunity with jab rollouts underway across the globe. While UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson recently told Britons that they won't need a vaccine passport to visit the local pub, His French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, is considering creating a digital vaccine passport without which French citizens might be barred from visiting restaurants and other public places. That comes from the article, More Countries Adopt Vaccine Passports to Boost Tourism, posted March 11th, originally published at Zero Hedge. (laughs) 
the Danish Health Authority on Thursday halted the use of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine for 14 days. It follows reports of, quote, serious cases of blood clots among vaccinated people, unquote. A statement read, The Danish Health Authority stopped short of saying there was a direct link between the vaccine and the blood clots, quote, at the time being, unquote. Shortly after the announcement, Iceland followed suit. The Danish Medicines Agency said it had launched an investigation into the vaccine. That was from the article, Denmark suspends use of AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. Serious cases of blood clots. Posted March 11th, originally published at DW. The Fukushima disaster in March 2011 resulted in 16,000 deaths, causing some 165,000 people to flee their homes in the Fukushima area. Both the Japanese and Western media tend to downplay the impacts of nuclear radiation, which has spread to vast areas in northern Japan, not to mention the contamination of the food chain. The continued dumping of highly radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean constitutes a potential trigger to a process of global radioactive contamination. Amply documented, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, was involved in a cover-up, and so was the Japanese government. That was from a recent introduction to the article under the headline, March 11, 2011, Fukushima, a nuclear war without a war, the unspoken crisis of worldwide nuclear radiation. By Professor Michel Chosodovsky, posted March 10. These are just a few of the featured articles appearing last week on the Global Research website. Regular visitors to the site are encouraged to send monetary contributions by fax, mail, or online. Just go to globalresearch.ca and click Donate on the menu bar. The phenomenon known as the Arab Spring inundated people throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Looking around today, it's hard to understand how the people on the ground benefited. But the five major countries where the leadership of the country was overthrown, or at least threatened, were Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, and Syria. In Syria, the population had been demonstrating starting in January They were expressing dissatisfaction and demanding reforms as well as showing solidarity with other Arab Spring actions. On March 6th, several children were arrested for scribing anti-government graffiti in the southern town of Dara. This outraged several community members and they took to the streets demanding political and economic reforms. Nine days later, on March 15th, the Ides of March, Thousands took to the streets in cities all over the country. In Dara, in, on the 19th, security forces tried to contain the spread of violence, and on March 24th, according to the Standard account, dozens of innocent people were shot and killed by security forces. As reported by CNN, the uh, Dara was the spark that lit the Syrian flame. There is, however, a popular misunderstanding of just what went down in Dara 15 years ago. Stephen Swahini is a political analyst, journalist, and commentator. He's also Syrian and based in Latakia. He cuts through a lot of the misleading information. The world and the Western media did not mention about the weapons that they found in the Umari Mosque. And they did not mention about the... uh, in the first few days in Latakia, I'm here because it started, Daradin started in Latakia. When the Latakia, in Latakia, the protesters in Latakia came out and started charting Christians to Beirut and Alawites to the grave. And also happened in the same time, I'm saying this in the beginning of the war on Syria. There was no that big military operations and there were not any security. When the... Uh, a farmer in Banyas in the Latakian coast, a farmer, he had his veg- vegetables 
moving them from the village to the city to sell them, he was caught by the protesters and uh, tortured and cut up and killed. And his name was Nidal Janud. And there's pictures of him while they were taking him to kill him and chop him. That the Western media did not talk about. Also, in the summer of 2010, several months before the war on Syria started and so-called the Arab Spring, on the Turkish-Syrian border, on the Turkish side, the tents, they were put up. And no one knew at that time, why is Turkey putting those tents? And after that, when the war started and the refugees so-called refugees, they went and they sat uh, in those tents, they were all ready. So how did Turkey predict that? That's number two. Number, uh, sorry, number three. Number four, and the most important, we go back to Dara. In Dara, the question is not why did the Syrian government or the Syrian army shot at the people. You have to ask why did the who shot at the security forces? Because in any country in the world, whoever uh, the security forces, they are trained. If you get shot at, you will shoot back. Several Syrian security forces in the first month in Dara, Latakia, Hamas, and several cities around were killed. In, uh, in the first few days on the hands of the so-called or people who are planted in the uh, uh, between the protesters. And also, we are, I wrote in my article the day before Dara how the, uh, the terrorists and the weapons, they were coming from Benghazi in Libya all the way on the raft line to both to Turkey and to Jordan on the Jordanian, uh, the Jordanian Syrian border. So all of these evidence, it shows that this war on Syria, it, uh, who caused it, it was who, and there were countries who caused it, countries who pumped it, pumped money, and who wanted the Western media to show and to see that the Syrian government and to demonize the Syrian government. But in reality, two years ago, the foreign minister of Qatar, Hamad bin Jassim, came out and he said, we spent $137 billion on Syria, but in the end, we fought with each other. And that's when he means Qatar and Saudi. He said, we fought with each other and we got uh, distracted from our main course and that is taking over Syria and destroying Syria. It is argued that one of the factors of in the instability was inclement weather conditions running over the course of several years in advance. This was the focus of the journal Proceedings of the Natural Academy of Sciences, which found that droughts resulted in water shortages in Syria, Turkey, and Iraq, which killed livestock and forced the cost of food through the roof. 1.5 million rural residents made their way to the outskirts of the cities, this on top of the many new people who were forced to flee Iraq during the war. It is understandable tensions would drive the population to their wits' end. Stephen Swahini had this to say. People were eating out of their own uh, crops. They are, Syria is a highly advanced, was highly advanced an agriculture co uh, country. Syria did not import anything from abroad in 2010 and before. Syria used to eat their own wheat, eat their own fruit, and eat their own vegetables from their own land and import nothing. So, but the drought that happened, it was because of the lack of rain, and they're not going to go out, the people, just over the drought, and they're not going to pin it on the, uh, the, on the Syrian government. A group of officers within the Syrian army defected over the next several months. They said they were disenchanted by the requirements to fire on civilians given the cause they were fighting for. Their new group was formed by the end of July and called the Free Syrian Army. They were, at least at the time, at the heart of taking the Syrian army down by force and got moral support from the U.S. I asked Stephen Swahini to comment on what exactly is known about the Free Syrian Army. Their background is radical Islamic uh, mentality, terrorism, and Muslim Brotherhood. And they are bloodthirsty. They killed people 
Just because they belong to a different sect or the different religion, they destroyed mosques. They, uh, for other sect, they destroyed uh, churches. They killed. Uh, they went into villages in the suburbs of Latakia and they killed villages, complete villages, women, children, and men and older, just because they belong to another a uh, sect. Uh, different than their own sect and different than their own mentality. Even if you're, they're, the, you're the same sect as them, Sunni, but if you're not radical and you're not f- fundamentalist, sorry about that. If you're, uh, if you're not a, sl- a radical Islamic and you have that black, uh, uh, the black mentality, the murder of blood, they will also kill you. They will call you, you're against God and they will kill you. They are not different about the Al-Nusra Front or the ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Taliban. They are all the same mentality, but a different name. And I told you in the first beginning of the war on Syria and in Latakia, the people started charting those, uh, those sectarian talk. And those people who charted the sectarian talk, in the end they came out and they went to the FSA and they became leaders of the FSA. The Syrian civil war was not reliant purely on their internal resources. They had help. An army of 10,000 defecting Syrian army troops, according to U.S. estimates, had organized a command and headquarters in Turkey in the Turkish province of Satay next to Syria. Stephen Swahini explains their role. Syria is over 10,000 years old. So 400 years out of that 10,000, they were occupied by the Ottomans who are Turkish. When they came out, they kept greedy and they wanted Turkey. And especially, they are greedy for the north of Syria and in particularly Aleppo city. And we saw the first thing that the Turkish, uh, pro-Turkish terrorist groups, and that's uh, so-called FSA, Nusra Front, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, Jish al-Islam, they're all the same. Uh, they're all the same group and they're all the same funding. They get the same funds. So they're, they are greedy and they want Aleppo because Aleppo is not only important because it's a huge city and it had before the war six million people, but also because Aleppo, it was, and until now it is, the economical capital of Syria and it has the, one of the biggest, it has some of the biggest factories in the Middle East. And uh, also Syria, In the factories of Aleppo, they used to produce everything that Syria needs before the war. And that's why when the terrorist groups supported by the Turkish regime or the Ghana's regime, when they went into Aleppo, the first thing they did, they went to the industrial areas in uh, in Aleppo, like Sheikh Najjar and other, and they disabled the factories and they took them to Turkey. And their evidence, and those, uh, that evidence, it was shown in the uh, uh, Security Council and in the United Nations. The Syrian government gave the evidence that the Turkish. Also, the Turkish regime has been benefiting out of this war for the last 10 years. They've been buying oil from the Kurdish. Then before the Kurdish, they were buying oil from ISIS. And their, and their also evidence came out to the, the media. Also, they have been buying the wheat, the stolen wheat. And they had a big role on the sanctions on Syria. That's the Syrian people are suffering off of that. So to Erdogan, the present Erdogan of Turkey and the uh, regime of Erdogan, it was a big, Syria was a big money maker. As the war expanded, the Free Syrian Army invited several militant jihadists to enter the fray. The jihadists were in fact Al-Qaeda and offshoots, the Al-Nusra Front and one of the strongest groups, the Islamic State of Iraq, which in April of 2013 adopted the name Ad-Dawla al-Islamiya fi Iraq wa Sham, which translates to the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Very soon, the rebellious army in Syria could develop a reputation of embracing strict, even brutal, fundamentalist practices including cutting off the heads of enemies. Of course, another player in the Syrian civil war was the United States. It would later be documented that as early as 2012, the U.S. would render covert logistical assistance to the Syrian and non-Syrian groups waging warfare on the Syrian state, eventually elevating to fully arming them in 2013. Author Gareth Porter revealed this situation in a 2017 article he wrote for the American Conservative, 
Gareth Porter is an independent investigative journalist, historian, and author who has covered U.S. wars and interventions in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Yemen, and Syria since 2004, and was the 2012 winner of the Gellhorn Prize for Journalism. He explains the details of what would turn out to be profound assistance behind the scenes. The Turkish government specifically um, uh, importuned the Obama administration, uh, President Obama himself, to carry out a program of uh, overt uh, assistance to the uh, to the opposition in uh, in in Syria, and they even uh, and they wanted heavy weapons to be uh, given to oppositionists inside Syria in 2011, uh, and and even suggested that Turkey would invade Syria militarily in order to overthrow the regime if the United States promised to provide uh, air cover for the operation, essentially. Uh, Obama did not buy any of this. The only thing he was willing to do was to uh, help the Saudis specifically uh, to get small arms for the opposition, at least at the beginning. We're talking about now about 2011 into 2012. Obama agreed to set up a CIA program, which was carried out by then CIA director David Petraeus, to help the Saudis uh, to, to, to help get arms into uh, the, uh, the Syrian opposition. And what they did was they had the CIA uh, organize an entire operation from beginning to end with uh, arms that were gathered in Benghazi in Libya, uh, where of course the United States had a major diplomatic post. Um, in warehouses there in Benghazi, they used the arms that had been collected from the regime um, to, uh, to, to basic, well, they, they, they were arms that were, they were collected over the years. They were arms that were then sent by ship uh, by, by, uh, by, by uh, ship to two small ports in Syria. And uh, the, the results of this were quite, uh, quite important, quite significant. There were thousands of tons of, uh, of, of these arms that were shipped to Syria under this CIA program over the first year. But then of course, we had uh, the, the uh, Benghazi attack on the US CIA uh, outpost there in, uh, in the, the uh, city. <laughs> and that was the end of that CIA program. It had to fold up immediately. And then, uh, you know, there was a question of what the United States was going to do uh, to try to replace it. Uh, and what, what happened was that uh, the CIA was proposing an even more daring covert program, but for the time being, at least Obama refused. Um, and from 2012 until 2013, there was uh, uh, only, the only thing that was going on was that the CIA was helping the Saudis to purchase arms, uh, giving them contacts in Eastern Europe, in former Soviet uh, countries. This was important, however, because it allowed the Saudis to make huge amounts of purchases of arms, which were then shipped to uh, Turkey. And uh, from Turkey then uh, overland, they went into Syria to arm the Syrian rebels. Now, by this time, the important thing to understand, to recall here, is that by 2012, late in 2012, it was very clear that the U.S. intelligence agencies, U.S. intelligence community uh, was, was very forthright about this, that Al-Nusra Front, the Al-Qaeda outfit that had uh, grown up inside Syria after the beginning of the uprising, uh, had essentially taken over leadership of the armed, uh, the, the armed uh, force against, uh, against the Assad regime. And so all of these arms that were being shipped into uh, Syria were ending up, not all of them, but very large percentage of them were ending up 
in the hands of Al Nusra Front and its close allies. So what we were doing essentially was uh, arming the terrorists in Syria. Syria, we were arming the people who represented international jihadism and who had their own obvious political uh, military agenda uh, to, to take over Syria themselves. And uh, the Obama uh, administration became quite clear about this by uh, 2013. They openly admitted to the New York Times that that's what was going on, that, that most of the arms were falling into the hands of essentially Al-Qaeda and its allies in Syria. So now we come to uh, 20, the end of 2013. This is when Obama caved in to further pressure from U.S. European allies as well as Middle Eastern allies to start a program of actual lethal aid, direct lethal aid from the United States itself to the Syrian opposition. And uh, this took the form of, uh, you know, among other things, selling uh, tow anti-tank missiles to the Saudis under the, with the understanding that the, the Saudis would pass them out to Syrian opposition groups um, which were identified by the United States as approved. And of course, they, they were the groups that would then join with Al-Qaeda to carry out uh, a major offensive in Idlib province, which took over the entire province, essentially to make it under the control of Nusra Front, uh, which, which was uh, an extremely alarming development which the Obama administration again understood was taking place and refused to intervene to stop it. It said it, it did not tell its allies, no, you cannot do that. On the contrary, it uh, turned a blind eye to it and effectively approved it. Mm -hmm. So we have the Obama administration effectively taking a high risk that the uh, al-Nusra Front, the al-Qaeda uh, group in Syria, would be in a position of military strength where eventually it could make a bid to take power in Syria. And I think, you know, I'm not gonna try to carry it forward further, but uh, we know that what happened then was that the Russians intervened, the Iranians intervened and the tide of war turned around. Al Qaeda was defeated in, uh, in, in the key parts of Northern Syria um, they ended up having to gather in Idlib, where that's the only redoubt now where the jihadists still hold sway. Um, and uh, the, the Assad regime was able to essentially uh, uh, recover control over most of the area that had been lost uh, to the rebels because of the intervention of the United States uh, and the CIA. The U.S. was involved in other ways as well. Syrians in the diaspora would play a profound role attempting to influence policy abroad in support of rebellion against Bashar al-Assad. The um, Syrian American Medical Society, their role was to document uh, or claim to document all of the chemical attacks in Syria from the beginning. They, they operated on the basis that any claim by anybody in the zone that was uh, uh, supposedly being attacked uh, was to be believed and therefore that became documentation of chemical weapons attacks by the government. Um, so, so that was uh, one of the things that they were contributing to the overall atmosphere in the United States of uh, support for the opposition support for uh, basically Nusra Front as a, an ally of the opposition. You're listening to the Global Research News Hour, broadcasting from CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg and from partnering radio stations across Canada and the United States. In August 2013, there was a critical moment in the fight against the Syrian army. On August 21st, your rockets carrying the deadly gas sarin were fired on occupants of the opposition-controlled region of Gauta in the suburbs of Damascus. 
Death estimates range from 281 to 1,729 people, making it the most deadly use of chemical weapons since the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s. But Porter detailed some of the problems in the government's so-called assessment, concluding that the attack was launched by Syria. My position was that uh, this was not solid evidence at all of a chemical weapons attack. And the fact, uh, what, you know, the fact that the uh, director of national intelligence did not, was not willing to put his name on this was an obvious sign, an indication that the intelligence analysts themselves uh, were not ready to put their imprimatur on it. They did not believe that this represented an accurate intelligence picture of the situation or, an, or a, a fair assessment, an intelligence assessment of uh, whether indeed there was a, a chemical weapons attack by the opposition. So I, I think that um, the evidence that has come out since then, and I've written more pieces, you know, I wrote more pieces after this came out, further suggested that there were real questions about exactly what happened in that August 13th um, uh, chemical weapons attack. Uh, I think that there's no doubt that some chemical weapons were used, um, but, but the amount of chemical that was apparently used was so small that uh, it raises serious questions about what this actually means. Um, it could have been done by either side, but the, the obvious uh, uh, you know, reason for doing so lay on the side of the armed opposition because they could use that to help mobilize U.S. further military involvement. They could hope that there would be further U.S. military involvement in the conflict in Syria, whereas the Syrian government, it's very difficult to come up with a good reason why they would use a very small amount of chemical uh, in this uh, sort of attack uh, with the likely result that it would be discovered and not just discovered, but that it would be blamed on the government. Um, and by the way, this chemical weapons attack, if, you know, assuming that it was a chemical weapons attack, occurred when a UN uh, group investigating chemical weapons was in Syria, it was in Damascus. So it was our, it was just a minutes away from being able to uh, go and carry out an investigation. And ultimately, uh, of course, there was an investigation, but uh, this was not something that suggests that the government had a reason for carrying out a chemical weapons attack at that moment. And by the way, the, the final reason that I would give for doubting this is that this happened at a time when the government was very much on the offensive and not, re not on the defensive um, uh, against attacks by the opposition. So, uh, you know, there was every reason for them not to jeopardize the uh, progress that they were making militarily by having a major issue come up that could be the basis for the United States uh, intervening militarily in, in, the, in the conflict. So the Syrian civil war had in fact formidable powers directed toward them by the United States, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and even Israel and Islamic jihadists. But countering this was not only Russia, who joined militarily alongside Assad in 2015, but numerous people within Syria itself. It's not difficult to see this reality if the alternative to the president of Syria is a terrorist faction. One Western journalist has contributed an extraordinary amount of knowledge about what is going on within Syria. Her name is Vanessa Beely. She's traveled to Syria for almost five years. Here, she relays some details of what she was told about reactions to the war and the Syrian leader. Two important things here. First of all, the Syrian Arab army is the Syrian people. There isn't a single family in Syria that doesn't have uh, a father, son, husband, brother, uh, relative in the Syrian Arab army, or um, the majority of families have been affected by the martyrdom of a family member or a husband, etc. 
Um, and so that, you know, that's a very important point to make because the the propaganda in the West is very much that the Syrian Arab army is is Assad's militia, you know, and, and that it's, it's fighting on his behalf. Um, the army is fighting to defend its own people um, and it's fighting to liberate its country from the terrorist or extremist plague that has been forced upon the country by external hostile states, of course, led by the US coalition. And among, amongst that, I put very, very prominently the UK, um, who I believe have been responsible for the majority uh, of the intelligence operations against Syria from even before 2011. As regards the broad base of support for President Assad, um, I think Eva Bartlett, another um, colleague of mine and another much acclaimed journalist who has spent considerable time inside Syria, just as I have, we would say the same thing. You know, if you speak, this is a perfectly normal country. <laughs> In other words, people have criticism of the government, of the ministers, of decisions that are made. But almost everyone will say to you after they've complained about the government, they will say, but the president is the red line. We don't accept criticism of our president. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, the problem is that the debate in the West has been so reductionist. It has effectively prevented any analysis or, or positive analysis or constructive analysis of President Assad um, and his governance of this country, his progressive and reformist stance that everybody was was congratulating him on prior to 2009. Uh, I challenge everyone to find criticism of President Assad prior to 2009, when, of course, that was the point that he um, opted for the Russian-backed Iranian pipeline uh, in opposition to the U.S. backed Qatari uh, pipeline, Qatari Turkish pipeline. The white helmets are among the more prominent features of the Syrian war. There they are rescuing damaged civilians, including children, from the sites of war. However, they reside in areas dominated by the opposition forces and only typically providing footage of the rescues from Syrian government assaults. Through careful research, it was Vanessa Beely who exposed the origin of the White Helmets as a foreign-funded, foreign-founded asset of terrorists. I mean, the White Helmets were established predominantly by British intelligence um, with uh, funding from a number of uh, hostile states towards Syria, including, of course, the US. They were funded by Comonix, which is a, a, a recognized CIA outreach agent. Um, they were established by uh, a, a British agent, a former military operative, um, military intelligence operative, James Le Mazurier, uh, in 2013 when he was working for uh, analysis, reach, research and knowledge, sorry, ARC group, um, which were at that time being funded by the UK Foreign Office to, to establish um, not only the White Helmets, but to establish um, PR and media complexes to uh, increase the criminalization and demonization of the Syrian government. And that has recently been exposed in a series of leaks of UK Foreign Office documents showing the extent to which they control both the, the, the media output uh, and um, the the protectionism and PR for the armed groups, uh, which they euphemistically, of course, called um, moderate rebels throughout the history of this war. Um, and the White Helmets were very much instrumental in, of course, providing what I call the equivalent to the weapons of mass destruction, dodgy dossier, the chemical weapons attacks. And, um, of course, in 2018, we had the uh, Duma uh, chemical weapon attack or alleged chemical weapon attack that has since uh, very much been discredited by members of the OPCW investigative team. And of course, currently um, that has been um, extensively um, reported by a number of 
of journalists. Um, the inspectors themselves have spoken publicly at the UN, Ian Henderson being the first. Jose Bustani, uh, who was the former director general of the OPCW, has come forward to defend the inspectors and to demand or, or to request that the OPCW saves its own credibility by airing um, the concerns of the inspectors, which were some of the most uh, high level inspectors at the OPCW. And the White Helmets, um, even a BBC producer, Riam Dalati, stated on Twitter that um, he was absolutely certain that the hospital scenes in Juma had been staged. And by default, that means that they were staged by the White Helmets. Of course, that had or that was the conclusion already arrived at by um, Russian experts that had gone in to inspect the, the premises after the uh, accusations of chemical use and had found there to be no chemicals used. I myself was in Damascus when that attack happened. I went to Duma shortly after, exactly the same. I found absolutely no evidence of any chemical attack whatsoever. But um, as I say, months later and after um, the uh, UK, French and US unlawful aggression, the bombing of uh, Damascus and the surrounding countryside on the basis of the dodgy dossier, which of course was effectively produced by the White Helmets and Jaish al-Islam, uh, the armed extremist group that was in control of Duma. And interestingly enough, Jaish al-Islam, their PR was being provided by uh, an organization called Incostrat. Now, Incostrat's co-founder was Emma Winberg, who later became Emma Le Mazurier, the third wife of James Le Mazurier who was the founder of the White Helmet. So there we see a little bit of correlation between the potential of providing um, uh, media whitewashing for these extremist groups. And we need to remember that Jaish al-Islam um, were responsible for some of the most heinous crimes against Syrian civilians in the history of the war. In 2013 in Adra, they burned civilians alive in the bread furnaces. Um, they decapitated many others, tortured many others, and, and kidnapped thousands and took them to Tauba jail, which was an absolutely, I, I visited the jail after liberation, and it was horrifying. And speaking to survivors of imprisonment in that jail, the, the torture that was carried out against them, um, wide-scale chemical experiments, drug experiments on them. I mean, it, it was just hideous. And this group used chemical weapons against the Kurds uh, in Aleppo in 2016, I believe, or it might be 2015. Um, they caged civilians in uh, Duma and used them as human shields in November 2015. So this is the kind of group that the British Foreign Office is providing PR for. And the wife of the founder of the White Helmets was effectively in charge of the operation that, that was responsible for that PR. So there is, you, you know, when you start to look at this, the nexus um, of propaganda producers is very closely linked. It's very easy to see how these uh, various organizations intertwine and act um, cohesively to, to turn the tide of opinion against the, the Syrian government and its allies. And the White Helmets uh, were absolutely instrumental in that because they were effectively responsible for the production of the Khan Shehun chemical attack um, the uh, Duma chemical attack. But not only that, of course, you know, they, they are tasked, according to British government documents, with providing the evidence that corroborates um, UK foreign policy in Syria. Now, I, I'm paraphrasing, but that was effectively written inside a British government document. It was also written that Human Rights Watch and, and Amnesty International almost entirely rely upon evidence from the White Helmets to produce their reports, which of course are never positive towards uh, the Syrian government. And while the White Helmets are um, ostensibly tasked with the documenting of war crimes, they live among groups like Al-Qaeda, like Jaish al-Islam, uh, HTS, Ar-Sham, -Ar 
sectarian, extremist, violent, brutal groups that have carried out multiple atrocities against Syrian civilians. And not one of those atrocities has been recorded by the White Helmets, despite the fact that they are actually on the scene of those attacks. The ultimate tool in the West's arsenal to, in support of the overthrow of Assad is, of course, the mainstream media. But in Syria, the media seems to go beyond where it was in Afghanistan and Iraq in conditioning people to really despise the Assad government. Vanessa Bealey addressed the point. I think for me, probably, um, the incident that exposed the media for the really the, the, the war mongering charlatans that they really are was the liberation of East Aleppo in December 2016. And if you imagine that for five years, the media had been selling the story that um, Russia and Syria were bombing civilians, were massacring their own people, um, were starving and besieging their own people, um, and then when you see uh, the liberation in full flow and you see the civilians literally breaking down in tears to be liberated from incarceration by armed groups dominated by Al-Qaeda, who were effectively, again, imprisoning, incarcerating, torturing, executing, crucifying uh, these civilians for those five years, any aid, any humanitarian aid that was coming into the area was being um, stockpiled by those armed groups and sold at extortionate prices to the civilians. And again, this is a pattern which was repeated across all other uh, areas of liberation inside Syria. It's, it's a familiar story and we have it again now in Idlib in the sense that humanitarian aid is coming in through the Bab al Hawa uh, border crossing with Turkey. And Bab al Hawa is a trading hub for Al Qaeda. I mean, that has been extensively documented in various articles, even by um, some more mainstream media. Um, and so we know that even the aid coming in, while of course they are they're amplifying the humanitarian crisis, etc., and all this is the fault of the Syrian Arab army and its allies and the Syrian government. In reality, of course, what's happening is that they're providing revenue for the armed groups that they support and finance and arm and equip. And uh, by doing so, of course, they, they enable the, the starvation, the deprivation of those civilians that then the media is, is calling for the world to protect. So for me, this is, you know, <laughs> this is the most uh, egregious hypocrisy on behalf of the media. I mean, it's criminal. Because actually, um, I'll always remember when I entered Hanano, which was a district in East Aleppo. And I was actually on that day, and that was the only day that there were any Western media there. And from memory, I think it was, um, there might have been an ITV guy there. I can't actually remember. Um, but there were foreign journalists there that had been responsible for the propaganda that had effectively maintained <laughs> The, the siege of East Aleppo and, and the misery for the, for the human beings in that area that was occupied by the armed groups. And the reporters were walking through the streets and the people were coming out of the houses in tears. And I, I don't, you know, obviously they had been um, deprived of any contact with the outside world. They had no idea of the level to which the Western media had been responsible for their continued um, bloodshed and, and starvation and deprivation. And I, I, I think Aleppo was the one point where I, read, I did break down because to see these people set free and to see them actually welcome the very people that had maintained their imprisonment effectively, right? Because those, those media were responsible for the various ceasefires, for example, that, that, that decelerated um, the Syrian Arab army advances that allowed uh, the, the extremist groups to, to bed in, bed down and to take civilians as human shields. But, you know, another aspect that was never, ever talked about and to continue the mortar and rocket attacks on uh, the Western areas of Aleppo that were, of course, 
um, still under the protection of the Syrian government. Um, and the media, in, in my view, throughout Syria, but in Aleppo in particular, I think, was almost entirely responsible for the maintenance of that siege. So the war has been waging now for 10 years. There have been two replacements of the U.S. president in the interim, but President Assad remains in power. With most regions freed, he seems to have a tighter grip on victory in the war than he had several years back. The U.S. and the Islamist brigades are left in a few small areas. But Biden is back. Uh, Perhaps he will now re-engage the conflict in some limited way. There was an attack in the form of airstrikes on an area near the Iraq border in retaliation against a rocket attack on Iraq earlier in the month. I asked the guests to summarize the assessment of how Syria will still fare in the months and years ahead. Today, there are several pockets of, uh, of ISIS, and that is where in the east of Syria, on the Syrian-Iraqi border, and in the area called Al-Tanaf, and who's in, ch- who's in charge of that area is the United States Army. And that is the terrorists, they are being protected by the uh, United States Army and coming, the attack, uh, they had several attacks lately actually in, uh, uh, in New Year's, New Year's Eve they were, they did a huge attack against civilians on the desert Palmera de Rosor uh, highway. They did several attacks there in, uh, on New Year's Eve, and uh, several days after, they killed several, several, there were several martyrs and tens of injured, and they do the attack, and they go back to the Al-Tanaf area, where not Russian or Syrian uh, can go and bomb there, because the Americans are there. So the ISIS are being protected by the United States Army, and no one can come and bomb that area because the Americans are over, over there. So to defeat ISIS completely, the United States government and the United States Army, who is illegally in Syria, has to pull out of East Syria, have to uh, pull out of all of Syria, and that's time the Syrian army and the Russians can defeat ISIS in the desert of Syria, who are causing and killing innocent people every every day uh, or every other day, and uh, and they do the operation that the ISIS they do they kill, then they go back to the American. So the Americans need to uh, cooperate, but they don't because they they are using that uh, those groups in feeding, like giving, putting wood on the fire to keep it going. And that is what the United States want and their allies, like Turkey and the Israeli occupation and other countries. They want to dis, uh, keep Syria in war and they want to keep it to steal the oil. They want to keep uh, and keep it into a million pieces because everyone, Turkey and, uh, and, and the United States and others, are benefiting off of this war. I think as far as bombing is concerned, I think that's over. I think that uh, ground operations, um, uh, you know, combat operations by the United States is out of the question. Um, and and I, I think that the era of U.S. Middle East wars is, in fact, going to draw to a close because of the fact that the United States has to gear up for China. I mean, that's going to wipe everything else uh, off the uh, off the charts, uh, you know, it's it's not going to be possible to maintain uh, for very much longer a U.S. presence in the greater Middle East. Okay. But well, but as far as the future of Syria is concerned, that's that's another, that's that's very much more difficult, um, and and Syria is in a terrible situation in terms of humanitarian crisis. Um, you know, it's got a serious uh, crisis of. Uh, COVID-19. I'm sure you have probably read the fact that the president and his wife have both contracted COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a sign that, you know, just one sign that, that it's much more prevalent within the country, uh, not surprisingly. Um, I think the medical situation is in terrible shape. Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, suffering from, you know, the economic b- blockade of Syria that's been carried out. And uh, whether that's going to come to an end is another question. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not terribly hopeless, hopeful about that. 
Turkey has effectively annexed um, what it calls a buffer zone, but it's annexed um, a, a serious amount of territory from the northwest across to the northeast. Um, America is now embedding itself. It recently, Biden recently moved in air defense systems into the northeast. Um, <clears throat> and prior to that, uh, since his inauguration, the con have been pouring into the northeast so the military footprint is effectively increasing um, alongside that isis attacks have been increasing we are receiving reports that uh, the us uh, is ferrying isis fighters from iraq into syria and from syria uh, from the northeast of syria into the al badia area the desert area um, near Deir ez uh, and then they are conducting attacks against Syrian Arab army and Russian positions. Uh, you have the American occupation base at al Panaf on the border uh, with Iraq and Jordan, um, and beneath that you have the Rukban refugee camp, euphemistically called the refugee camp, because it is effectively a training and recruitment center for armed groups. Around al Tanaf, you have a 55 kilometer exclusion zone where the US is running military exercises with a number of armed extremist groups. Uh, and they have uh, brought in the HIMARS, um, the high mobility artillery systems, which have a range, maximum range of about 300 kilometers. So potentially from there, they could actually target the outskirts of Damascus. Um, so the US is not leaving. Not only is it not leaving, of course, what it's doing, and I think this is now its policy, it's bedding in, in in the oil region in the Northeast. It's uh, allowing its proxies. Now, previously it was ISIS. Um, now it's the uh, Syrian De Democratic Forces, which are effectively the PKK, which of course previously the US were deemed a terrorist organization. Now, of course, it's aiding and abetting it to um, <coughs> occupy and ethnically cleanse um, the Northeast of Syria. Um, and the SDF is allowed uh, to take the Syrian oil as uh, revenue. Um, but not only that, the US um, was filmed, I think, in the last 24 hours, stealing uh, wheat and grain from that area and taking it uh, down to one of the crossings uh, into Iraq. So effectively, you know, what we're seeing is a multi-spectrum war uh, now, which is increasing under Biden. Um, Trump had already done a huge amount of damage. I mean, Trump brought in the Caesar Act, um, and which, of course, increased uh, the level of sadistic sanctions against Syria. And sanctions, you know, I mean, throughout history, sanctions target people. <laughs> they, they target ordinary people. They don't target what the US tells you the target is. That doesn't happen. Sanctions are designed to collectively punish the people of a nation. And, and, you know, people need to get over this idea that sanctions are either effective or anything other than criminal uh, punitive actions taken against the people of target nations. So, you know, I, I think it's an illusion to think that the US is admitting any defeat. I don't think it has any intention of admitting defeat. I think what you might see now is jockeying for position and uh, you might see some back channel negotiations going on. We've reached the end of our broadcast. Thanks again to guests Stephen Swahuni, Gareth Porter, and Vanessa Beely for their insights. Next week, we look at the 10-year anniversary of another Arab Spring target, Libya. We hope you'll join us then. You've been listening to the Global Research News Hour, a program funded by the Center for Research on Globalization and produced in collaboration with campus community radio station CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg on occupied Anishinaabe Gaking, the homeland of the Métis and the historical territory of the Nahiawak and the Nakota. The show is aired on other radio stations across Canada and the United States and is available for streaming or download at globalresearch.ca. To leave feedback on this program, please email globalresearchnewshour at gmail.com. I've been the show's host and producer, Michael Welch. Thank you once again for listening.